got some uh, of the dispensations printed off, if anybody doesn't have one yet, and would like one, uh, anybody just put up your hand, I think there's three left here, ah, okay, Thank you. anyone else, okay, I think most people got them, well, let's uh, continue uh, with our look at uh, this tapestry that God is weaving, uh, as uh, we think about the topic of the kingdom. And let's just ask the Lord for his help as we do that. Gracious Father, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. And Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, dear Lord, you don't hold back from us. Uh, you tell us what you're doing. And we praise you and we thank you for it. Uh, because, Father, we know you're sovereign, and we know, Heavenly Father, that in all things, you work all things together for good to those who are called according to your purpose. So, Father, as we consider your word now, we pray that you would give help uh, both uh, to speak about it, and then, Father, also with regard to our hearts, that you would work in each one of us and that you would help us, Father, to walk more closely with you. And so we ask these things, asking you to continue with us now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. And it doesn't hurt that we have Jewish coffee as well. <laughs> That's always a help. So, anyway, uh, I want to do a little housekeeping from the last time. We kind of uh, were jumping to uh, Babel, or Babel, uh, but just uh, a couple of little notes before we get there. Uh, and number one is uh, the fact that uh, we see the wickedness of man as we talked about and we saw that God intervened, but uh, in chapter 6 and verse 8. And uh, we related those uh, and mentioned them in uh, connection with the dispensations. And we just mentioned conscious and government, but I hadn't brought you back to that uh, to uh, relate these things to that. So uh, really what we're doing there uh, before the flood is uh, dealing with man having the test of conscience. Uh, so initially with Adam and Eve, it was free will, they failed. Uh, now we have conscience and man fails, and that's when God uh, is uh, exasperated, if put in our language, and uh, he's going to bring the flood. So that would relate to conscience. And then uh, we get into Genesis chapter 9, and that has to do with government. And let's just turn there for a few moments into Genesis chapter 9. And uh, we find in Genesis chapter 9, as Noah and his family emerged from the ark, uh, it tells us in chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so, of course, uh, when God initially created the earth, that also was the instruction then. Adam and Eve were to fill the earth. And now that the world, apart from Noah and his family, have been destroyed, the instruction is exactly the same, fill the earth. Uh, but there's change. And so uh, in this, uh, we see uh, the dispensation of government. And we uh, base that on uh, verses 5 and 6. There's a change now because before the flood, uh, as men was acting on their conscience, but now God is instituting human government. And so in verse 5 it says, Surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it, will require it, and at the hand of man 
At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now, if that's going to be administered, then you need some sort of rules and regulations. And so now we are thinking in terms of man's test. You'll remember that each of these is a test, each dispensation uh, is a test from God. And we're going to see if man can actually uh, be in obedience to God while he administers governmental authority. And of course, as we know, uh, we have failed. And uh, again, uh, as we come into the New Testament and we find Paul talking about this and talking about the responsibility of, of those in governmental uh, positions, uh, they uh, continue to be uh, responsible to God. So this is the test that's here. But as well as that, we have this uh, covenant that God uh, puts in place. Now, I want you to notice that this is a, go a covenant through Noah to mankind. Noah here is the representative of mankind, uh, because remember, there's just eight of them. And so this is a covenant that God gives to mankind with regard to a promise that uh, if he brings judgment, it will never again be by the flood. By the way, that's uh, a Northern Ireland picture. <laughs> and they, there's always a rainbow over Northern Ireland. That's because it's always raining. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, we have the rainbow, and of course the rainbow is, the, is God's God-given sign of that covenant that he makes with mankind that there will not again be judgment by flood. But of course, uh, Satan, and I keep saying this, and everything that we see in the world around us, Satan has no original ideas. And all he does is counterfeit and copy. And everything that God does Satan has some sort of copy of it. And here, of course, we see this very uh, noticeably in our world today with the appropriation by immorality of this sign of God's covenant with man. And so uh, we, uh, in effect, the leopard doesn't change his spots. And as we move on from this, uh, we find again that evil begins to overcome the world. And so, as the world repopulates after the flood, as we move on, uh, we come to Babel in chapter 11. So in Babel, uh, we actually have a little bit of back and forth here because in Babel we have the activity of Babel, uh, but in chapter 10, we have uh, some of the power or the people involved in Babel. And so in chapter 10, in verse 8, we see Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That phrase means that he was in opposition to the Lord. If you like, he is uh, uh, a representation of Antichrist, and of course the Antichrist will come, uh, but here in the very early in the life of this earth, uh, we have this representation of Antichrist. And so then it says, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So that's where we are. I know this is a little fuzzy, but I think you can figure it out. Uh, with the Euphrates and the Tigris, and we're in the land of Shinar, which is basically Babylonia. And uh, this is where uh, the events of chapter 11 are going to take place. I actually always chuckle in cha chapter 11 because uh, if it wasn't so serious, I think the Lord, I don't know if he intended it to be uh, amusing, uh, but as the persons of the Godhead 
talk to each other and they say, let's go down and see, okay? And so uh, I, I just find that a little odd. There's these little puny ants on the, on the earth that's been created, part of the creation of God. And they are going to build this city and they're going to build this tower. They're going to create their own economy, their own country, and they're going to create their own religion. And uh, I just get this idea of God, if you like, looking down on some little ants scurrying around. And God is going to see what they're doing. Not that he needed to see, he already knows. And so in verse 7, he says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left off to build the city. Of course, what they were doing was directly contrary to the Lord's command. He said to Noah, repopulate the earth. And they said, no, I don't think we want to do that. We're just going to gather together, and we're going to do our own thing and we're going to stick together. And really, it's a sticking together in opposition to the Lord. That's what it is. And uh, when God uh, says, we're going to confound the language, uh, verse 6, behold, the people is one. So there was a unity in their rebellion against Lord, God, and they have all one language, which gave them the ability to cooperate together. And they have, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Can I suggest that what God is doing, it's not that God is afraid that they'll get more powerful than him. <laughs> uh, that would never happen. Uh, but it's the idea that these rebellious ones in the earth would continue in their rebellion, and the rebellion would grow as they are able to cooperate together. And so as they cooperate together, they present a single opposition to God. And so God says, well, we'll take care of that. And it, isn't it just like a, a military exercise in a, in a sense? You know, if you're going up against the enemy, uh, you don't want to face them all at once. You'd like to be able to do something that separates them into smaller groups that maybe you can pick off. And so, in, a, in, a, in effect, God is doing exactly that. He said, we're not going to allow you. This earth is going to continue, uh, and you will be on it, but we're not going to allow you to present one unified uh, opposition to the holy God. And so he splits them up into various languages, which makes them cooperate together in their language groups. And in those language groups, they move out across the world. And of course, uh, archaeology confirms that. We don't need archaeology to confirm it, because God has said it. Uh, but it is always interesting when archaeology confirms these things. So we have this situation where... God is now moving and continuing to work on his tapestry, and Satan is implementing his strategies to again confuse and confound what God is doing, except God doesn't allow them to do that. And so he's managed them, he's managing evil and Satan along the way. And then you'll notice that we have in verse 10. We could spend lots of time talking about uh, Babel or Babel, but in verse 10, it talks about the generations of Shem. And you'll notice back in chapter 10, in verse 21, it talks about Shem. And of course, Shem that now is in this line from which the Messiah comes. And so we have uh, this continuation of God's work and how God is going to put everything together uh, to bring uh, things to uh, a conclusion with that beautiful tapestry when he has all done it. And uh, it's now continuing through Shem, the uh, son of Noah. So this is, again, uh, something that we see as God moves the program along and now he's going to do something that he has done before. 
I mentioned yesterday, he chooses a man. And now he's going to choose a man. And so when we get down to the end of uh, chapter 11, uh, when all of this has been going on, now we find that from the line of Shem, we have a family who are from this same area where Satan used his, the people who were his slaves to try and oppose God. And again, uh, I believe this is very purposeful on God's part. He says, you want to use that place to oppose me? Well, I'm going to take someone from that place and I'm going to make it, uh, make him uh, the father of a nation uh, that will, uh, from whom will come the Messiah and everything that you're doing, I will confound. And so uh, now we have Abram in chapter 12 and at the end of chapter 11, and he is from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, through Abram, of course, he was, his name was changed by God to Abraham. Uh, God uh, will create this nation through whom he'll reveal himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will be the one who will defeat Satan. He'll be the one who will retake the kingdom. He'll be the one who will provide salvation for whosoever will. He'll be the one who will ultimately deliver up the kingdom to the Father so that God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Verse 24. Is then cometh the end. Now this is the very end. <laughs> this is the very last thing. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to the Father. And so we're given uh, the end of the story. Uh, we're still going through how it is, how it is achieved, uh, but here we see the end play. Uh, then cometh the end when he, that is Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to, the, to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. That is, God the Father hath put all things under the feet of the Son, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all these things under him. In other words, uh, the only one uh, who is not under the feet of Christ is God the Father. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so, of course, the Son is the one through whom God works uh, in the power of the Spirit, and the end result is that he achieves the plans of God and is able to deliver the whole package up to the Father uh, through his obedience and through all that he has done, and particularly through the work on the cross. And so, as we uh, see uh, this uh, effort of Satan in Babel or Babel, uh, we see Mr. Nimrod there. Uh, see an artist's impression of the tower. I doubt it was very much it was like that. It seems that many of the uh, excavations in the East, in the Middle East, turned up uh, pyramids as they did in South America, etc. And uh, it is in Babylon that you have this false religion going. And so their efforts to build a tower didn't end their attempts at a false religion. And the religion that came out of there was a religion that is noted as the mother and child. And that mother and child religion permeated the world uh, we'll see in a moment some of the places where we have that mother and child 
religion, obviously in different places as, uh, as uh, human beings spread. Uh, the exact look of that changed here and there, but at its basis was the idea of the mother and child religion. These are just two examples. One, an Indian example, where goddess Indrani is termed the queen of the heavens. And we'll see that phrase in uh, the Bible in just a few moments. And of course, one that is very much with us in the Western world and uh, in many other parts of the world as well is Roman Catholicism, where we have Mar Mary, uh, whom uh, Roman Catholicism designates as a co-redeemer, that's the phrase they use, with the Lord Jesus Christ. As well as that, she is called the Queen of Heaven, and she is called a mediatrix. What does that mean? That means that if you want to get to Christ, you have to go through Mary. And so you can see how this mother and child religion spread. And of course, the reason it became what we know as, as Roman Catholicism is specifically in the time of Constantine, uh, when he, by the stroke of a pen, basically said, the whole empire is now Christian. Well, you have all these pagans and they've been following all the religions. So now those pagan religions simply get baptized with new Christian names. But the same practices and the same rituals and everything else continued, and uh, it resulted in what we know today as Roman Catholicism. So here are a list of some of the uh, mother and child in various countries. So in Babel, or Babel, uh, and we know this not from the Bible, but it is supported by the Bible, uh, that uh, initially in Babel, or in Babylon, uh, this whole mother and child thing came about with a lady called Semiramis, who was supposedly uh, Nimrod's wife. And uh, she, uh, Nimrod was supposed to have been killed and she produced her child as basically a reincarnation or a resurrected Nimrod. And so again, we begin to see Satan's uh, duplication of what God does. And he uses it to create falseness. And so the child was called Tammuz. And we'll see that when we get down to the bottom here and we'll look at a few verses. But in Assyria, the same thing with Astarte and Baal, and Isis and Osiris or Horus in Egypt, and in Greece, Aphrodite, Ceres, and Eros, and the one that you all keep with your wives, Rome, <coughs> Venus, Fortuna, and Cupid. So the 14th of February. And then in Asia, Cybele and Decius are Dioios. <laughs> and then various uh, manifestations throughout India and Roman Catholicism. Now, let's go to Jeremiah for a moment or two, and we'll see this talked about here. And so, as I say, Semiramis is not in the scriptures, uh, but Semiramis comes to us through historical evidence. But the supposed reincarnated Nimrod is with us in the scriptures, and we'll see that in Ezekiel and in 2 Kings in a few moments. But first of all, we'll see the Queen of Heaven in Jeremiah chapter 7. And there, when we get to chapter 7, and verse 17, <coughs> um, and 18, says, Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough and make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Anybody have hot cross buns during the year? These are your hot cross buns, by the way. That's, that's what this is. And they have come down to us again through the false religion of Romanism, which is a continuation of the paganism that uh, this is all about. 
And so uh, make cakes to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. And then chapter 44. Verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, and notice this, how brazen it is. Uh, this is Jeremiah speaking to his nation. And they say, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. And a little reminiscent of the New Testament, we will not have this man to reign over us. And then in verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goes forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes in the cities of Judah. You think conditions are bad and the, the church is a little weak now? This is the nation. This is Judah. And they're saying, hey, we've been all wrapped up in this stuff. We like it. And uh, it says, and in the streets of Jerusalem, uh, for them, and listen to this, they are attributing to uh, the queen of heaven the fact that they have food, good food. In other words, they're saying, yeah, you can keep your God, you can keep your Jehovah, uh, because he hasn't done anything for us. And so the queen of heaven has, so we're going to keep worshipping the queen of heaven. And it says, we, uh, for then had we plenty of victuals, or victuals, and were well, in other words, we had good health, and we saw no evil. Things were really good when we were following the Queen of Heaven. And you know what it's like when you follow that God, that Jehovah. It's not like that. And then in verse 18, but since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven and pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things. In other words, we've been short of everything. And... Uh, uh, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So all our difficulties that we're having, uh, it's all because we stopped uh, giving offerings to the Queen of Heaven. And then in verse 19, and when we burned incense to the Queen of Heaven and poured out drink offerings onto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. Do you want to see who's talking here? Remember we talked about gender roles? Mm -hmm. This is the ladies. And they're calling the shots. And they've got somebody that they resonate with. Hey, it's female. It's the queen of heaven. And we're just going to follow her. Now let's think about Tammuz in Ezekiel. Uh, as we look into Ezekiel chapter 8, first of all. In verse 12. Then said he unto me, son of man. Now this is where Ezekiel is brought to look through a hole in the wall of the temple. And so uh, it says, Then said he unto me, Son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? That's the elders, that's the leaders of the nation. Every man in the chambers of his imagery, his idols. For they say the Lord seeth us not, the Lord has forsaken the earth. Jehovah's gone away. He doesn't care. And so we don't really care either. He said also unto me, Turn thee again, yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, 
there sat women, <laughs> again, weeping for Tammuz. Weeping for Tammuz. What a sad, sad thing. And if you go back up to verse 11, you'll see who the ancients of Israel are. There stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Who are they? It's the priesthood. <laughs> and so here is really bad times in the nation, and uh, God uh, will deal with it, and uh, eventually he will take Judah into Babylon and cure them of idolatry altogether. But in the meantime, we have this direct connection with Babel or Babel and the false religion that was begun there. And it not only permeated uh, the, the various countries of the world, but it also permeated Judah and uh, made its inroads into the life of the nation, the Lord's nation. You think there's some parallels to today? Mm -hmm. and the world entering the church. Anyway, uh, God is going to deal with all of that as we go along. And so as we have gone, as we have gone through so far in Genesis, uh, we see the kingdom, we see Satan, we see salvation. In a few moments as we move on, we'll see the nation Israel. Uh, we'll see what happens to the Gentile nations. Of course, we saw Babylon and we saw the Antichrist. So themes that are begun there, and you'll find that when we get to Revelation, every one of these themes is all wound up. God dovetails it all together and finishes it all up as he would want it. And so now we move from Babel to Abram in chapter 12, and now we are in a dispensation number four, and that is the covenant of promise. And this is a blessing to the seed of the one who is chosen. And uh, the blessing will be personal, as uh, Randy has put up above there. It's personal, national, and international. In other words, there's going to be a blessing from God that is available to all men, but through <coughs> this man that he has chosen and the nation that will come from this man. And so as we move into the uh, dispensation of promise, uh, we are introduced to Abram. And as we mentioned, he's right from that area of Babylonia. <coughs> and uh, God told, tells him uh, at the end of chapter 11 uh, that he has to move out and he has to leave behind his country, but he also has to leave behind his family. Did he do that? No, he didn't do that. <clears throat> but he started moving. And so uh, God uh, told him uh, to move out without his family. In chapter 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord had said to Abram, so this is why Abram's moving, The Lord had said, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Away from your family and your father's house. Your, not only your immediate family, but your extended family. Leave them all behind. And so Abram does start to move, but he doesn't leave behind his immediate family. Uh, he travels with them, or they travel with him. And we'll find, as we go through, that even though God, in chapter 12, is going to make promises to Abram, God actually doesn't move uh, I was going to say seriously, serious all the time, but he doesn't complete things with regard to these promises until the family is gone. And so the first thing is that Terah, uh, Abram's father, dies. And then as we go on in chapter 13, we find the split from Lot, his nephew. And it's only after that that then God restates promises that he makes and chapter 12, and then when we get to chapter 15, God makes it a legal agreement to which he binds himself. 
And so uh, this is what we have. And so we know that Abram left Ur and he moved up and they spent some time in Haran. And then he started his southward journey into uh, this land that God was leading him to. And so as we, as we see Abram uh, in the, the move, we have in him another one of the messianic line. He's descended from Shem. So we've had the declaration of what God will do to provide salvation in Genesis 3.15 and what God will do to regain the kingdom, Genesis 3.15. And then we see the line that he chooses, Seth, Noah, Shem, and now Abraham. Abraham. And uh, of course, from Abraham, we know then that Isaac and Jacob and ultimately Judah uh, becomes uh, the, one, the one tribe from which the Messiah will come. And so we see God preserving this line even through all of the evil that Satan has promoted in the earth uh, with the corruption that we have seen along the way. And God is moving through his plan and now we are well into it. Now, with regard to God's plan, uh, we find this about Abraham, uh, but with regard to God's plan, uh, we're going to see that this is the absolute basis now. He's going to introduce a foundation for absolutely everything that happens from then to the end of the world. This that we will see uh, that the theologians like to call the Abrahamic covenant that we'll look at in just a moment. It is what uh, everything from now on is based upon along with some other covenants. And it also includes the church. Now, you've probably heard you don't see the church in the Old Testament, and you don't. However, we will see that there are three blessings that God promises Abram. One is land, one is a seed, and the other is the blessing. And that blessing in Jeremiah is called the new covenant. And that's why from about here on, we have the new covenant. And that applies to you and me. We live by it, don't we? We... Uh, believe that that is for us, but how come that it's something that God promised Israel that you and I get to share in? And so in what we will see here, in what is called the Abrahamic covenant, we will see the stage set for all of the rest of the history of the world. And much of it has to do uh, with how God will work all that out and the rest of the, much of the rest of the tapestry that God is weaving all has to do with this covenant that we will see. But with regard to Abraham's origins, uh, in Acts uh, it says, And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he be, uh, dwelt in Sharan. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. And then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans. And so we see this uh, understanding of the history of the nation. And then in Joshua, we get a little bit of uh, background to what uh, Abraham's family was like. It says, Joshua said to all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. So that uh, the other side of the flood is after the flood. Even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. So here we have Abram, or Abraham, as he became, and he was a pagan serving other gods when God put his finger on him. And of course, we know that Abraham came to faith 
in this God who spoke to him and told him to move out. Now, now we come to the Abrahamic covenant. We're just going to get a chance to introduce it. Uh, but in chapter 12, God makes promises. And so as he promises, Abram, as he still is, he says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. By the way, that uh, promise of God to bless those who bless Abraham's descendants is still in force, yeah. as is the uh, converse of that, that God will deal with those who do not bless Abraham's descendants. And so in verse 3 it says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. Now, can I suggest, obviously we see those who curse Israel, uh, the Islamic nations, <coughs> But up till recently, the great US of A has, at various degrees of seriousness over the years, basically been a supporter of Israel. And it's no longer true, is it, Americans? <laughs> it seems that the government policy is very much against Israel in these days. And so it is something that Really, if they took any notice of the scriptures, they would make a lot of effort to change that. But they're not. And so uh, this blessing uh, is extended then to all the families of the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll bless them that cur I bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee, that is in Abraham or Abram, and therefore his descendants, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And of course, we have that blessing. We have salvation available. We have the word of God. Uh, we have the person of the word of God who came and died on that cross. Uh, the blessings continue and continue and continue. And when we come to faith in him, the blessings increase even more. And so uh, we find these promises and uh, as well as that, uh, we get a uh, promise with regard to land. We'll not go down the verse, our time is gone, I've got about two minutes left. But then when he gets rid of Lot, uh, that's probably not the best way to put that. But when Lot goes and chooses Sodom, after that, God uh, restates the promises. And so in chapter 13, uh, he says in verse 14, The Lord said to Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And so we have this promise restated, but when we get to chapter 15, and probably uh, many of you know the scene here, and that is that God instructs Abraham, or Abram, to take uh, animals, to divide them, uh, the large animals, the fowls or the birds were not, and to put them in two rows, and then Abram, uh, was put into a deep sleep. And the words that are used is, is, are exactly the same expression and words that are used when we see Adam in a deep sleep when the Lord took a rib and formed Eve. And so this same process that God is using to communicate and to do something, and uh, God goes through between those pieces of animals uh, and uh, as he does that, he goes alone. And what is different about that is that this was a commonly known way of concluding a contract, a legal agreement. 
and usually both parties to the agreement would go through and after they came out to the other end, that was a, a sealed legal agreement. And both parties had responsibilities under the agreement that they were uh, accountable for. But here in this picture, we see only God going through and coming out uh, while Abram is asleep. And so what it's saying is, that God is the only person who is accountable for the fulfillment of this legal agreement. We're going to have to stop, so we'll pick that up first thing in the morning, uh, and we'll see the effects of this, and we will find that this is, and remember this word because we're going to use unconditional and conditional in another setting, and this particular agreement, this legal agreement, is an unconditional agreement. In other words, it's something that God has committed himself to for Abram and his descendants. And God is responsible for fulfilling it. And Abram and his descendants don't have to do anything to have it. It's like you have a rich uncle. And he dies. And as part of his will... Uh, about $2 million is deposited in your bank account. It's yours, you own it. And this is exactly the same thing when we come to the Abrahamic covenant. God commits himself, it's as though he's putting money in the bank and those who are the recipients are the owners of that. And by the way, we'll see it tomorrow, but this is why, for instance, Israel belongs to Israel. This never changes. It's an unconditional agreement that God has where he promises them land. It's the first thing. And nothing can change that. And so again, the nations of the world today... For instance, if you listen to what's happening in the United Nations, etc., they want to tell Israel what to do with that land. They want to tell Israel to give up what they call the West Bank. It's not the West Bank. It is Judea and Samaria. And if Israel gives up Judea and Samaria, basically the land is totally defenseless. And so all of this is still in force, and we'll see how it all works out tomorrow. So think about the Abrahamic covenant, and it's an unconditional covenant. Gracious Father, again, as we see you at work, Father, we're amazed. We're amazed at your grace. We're amazed at your mercy, that despite the evil intents of the heart of man, yet, Father, you still work. You still love those who you have created. And Father, as you have loved us and sent your Son to die for us, Father, we cannot help but be amazed. And so we, as we think about how you will reclaim the kingdom, as how you will provide salvation for man, as we go through the scriptures, Father, and trace your work throughout the scriptures in this tapestry that you're weaving, Father, we're just amazed at what you do and the uh, intent of your heart towards rebel men and women. And so, Father, just part us now. We thank you, Father. We uh, are able to have another meal, and we thank you because that's your provision. And we pray that you would bless your fellowship as we do that. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Amen.